Faith is something that one has or doesn't have, one doesn't construct it. For me, that's a difficult concept. The one thing I do believe is that of all the possible views of God, atheism is the least plausible. The idea that there's no meaning or purpose or origin, that, that the universe is as it always was. I mean, that cannot be. I sometimes joke by saying I don't believe in God, but I fear Him greatly. I've been American since the day I was born in New York City, and my father was quite conscious of how when he came to America and brought me to a world which is this open, uh, and in many ways this secular, the risk of me not following his way of life. And he had tremendous equanimity about that. Charles really did not like to talk about himself. And one of the most rewarding experiences I had here at Fox is finally convincing him to open up in a series of interviews around the release of his new book a few years ago, Things That Matter. And we spoke for hours. It was his life in his words. And I asked him, what do you think about this project? And he said, I don't like it. I need to write my father's story before I pass on because there's nobody who will remember the story except me now. It's the story of the 20th century. He was born in 1903, he died in 1987. By the end of his life, he spoke nine languages, not because he was a great scholar, but because he lived in a lot of places and not always moving willingly. And whenever he needed a word he didn't have in either French or English, he picked it out of Russian or Polish or German, it didn't matter. So no one understood what he was saying. But he had this sort of charming amalgam of all the cultures he'd lived in. And his story was an epic one because it starts in Eastern Europe, ends up in America with uh, France, Cuba, Brazil, uh, Belgium, everywhere in between. He would have preferred uh, that I follow in his way to be a religious Orthodox Jew. But he was completely open when he saw that I went a different way. He insisted when I was young that I study the scriptures and the commentaries and that I not be ignorant. He said, if you're ignorant, You'll never be able to choose wisely, but if you know, you'll choose, and you'll choose, and I will be happy and respect whatever you take. And that sense of openness reinforced my attachment to Judaism, even when I gave up the practice of the religion. I had this revelation about uh, the broad-mindedness and the universality of Jewish culture, and it brought me back at a different place, not the kind of practicing Jew that my father was but as somebody who deeply respects and wants to perpetuate Jewish culture. So that's where I ended up as a result of the broad-minded upbringing. And, and rather than abandon it, as many Orthodox Jews do when they're raised Orthodox and then rebel against it, um, that never happened to me. Well, I knew he wasn't a believer, and I am a believer. And, um, and I, you know, the God I worship, he would want Charles in his presence. Who wouldn't? When I became sort of politically conscious in my late teens, when I was in college, began to get involved in political thought, when I was studying political theory, I've been impressed by just the history around me in those days. Just look at, for example, in my 20s was the Cultural Revolution in China, and they set about to deliberately destroy 5,000 years of Chinese high culture the arts, the sciences, everything leveled by the wrong politics. And then, of course, the worst example of all is the Holocaust. Uh, there was a thousand-year-old civilization of European Jews flourishing, uh, producing in the arts and the sciences and culture, and all of it is utterly wiped out in six years. Now that tells you that you better get the politics right, or all the lovely, wonderful things in life are extinguished. And that's sort of the reason I changed what I was doing, starting out as a doctor and decided I wanted to be involved in what ultimately is the most important of all endeavors. I had applied to medical school really to please my family, I'm from a family of doctors. So I applied, I'd been accepted, and I deferred indefinitely. 
After that, I went to Oxford and I studied political theory, but I began to feel that I was sort of spinning out into a universe that didn't have anything to do with the real world. One night, a roommate sat on top of one of my armoires in a, in a yoga p position, maybe two in the morning. He was around a strange bird. And he said, Krauthammer, can pigs think? This is an important element in the thesis he was writing. And I had an enjoyable conversation that lasted into the morning. But I began to think, you know, that may not be the most useful way to spend your life. And I thought, you know, why don't I go to medical school and have a very straightforward life where everything is clear and plain? That afternoon, I went down to the public phone in the dorm. This was a long time ago. We didn't have cell phones. I called the registrar at Harvard Medical School and said, uh, I'd like to, um, to come in the coming class. And I remember her saying, well, one guy dropped out. We got a spot. If you're here on Monday, it's yours. So I grabbed a toothbrush. I didn't pack. I got on a plane and I left. Now, when I woke up in Boston <laughs> the next day, I thought to myself, oh, my God. God, what have I done? There's an internet story out there that I dove into an empty pool. And I traced the source of it to Arthur Schlesinger. He wrote that in his diaries. He never met me, spoke to me, doesn't know anybody, anything about me. So, I mean, if that's a reflection of the accuracy of the histories he wrote, then he's a, a master of fiction. I see it like as if it happened in a film. It was the end of my first year of medical school. We're doing neurology. We're studying the spinal cord, of all things. My classmate and I decide to skip the morning session. Beautiful July day. We're gonna, and we play tennis instead. We get, and we're, we're now headed over to class for the second session. We're very sweaty. It's very hot, very beautiful day. So we drop in next door to the medical school to the children's inn. You know, those are the, the uh, hotels nearby for the parents of children. When my friend and I arrived at the pool, there were lots of people in it, swimming in it. We go for a swim, we take a few dives, and I hit my head on the bottom of the pool. The amazing thing is there was no cut on my head. It just hit at precisely the angle where all the force was transmitted to one spot, and that is the uh, cervical vertebra, which severed the spinal cord. I'd been studying neurology. I knew exactly what happened. I knew why I wasn't able to move and I knew what that meant. And I knew I was at the bottom of the pool, and I knew I wouldn't be able to swim. I was sure that was the end. And interestingly enough, for people who talk about the near-death experiences, there was no panic, there was no uh, great emotion. I didn't see a light, I didn't, my life did not flash before me. You sort of get to a place where you're ready, and, and then you're suddenly, brought back to the world. My friend, thinking I was fooling around, left me down there for a while because he thought I was playing. Then he pulls me out and there were two books on the side of the pool when they, they picked up my effects. One was The Anatomy of the Spinal Cord and the other one's Man's Fate by Andre Malraux. Quite a choice. I didn't know what was coming, but it fit very well. <laughs> 